Hello, spirit siblings, and welcome to Outer Darkness. This is still the L Mom. You can still call me that. I just changed my channel name to match my content a little easier because the L Mom doesn't exactly say true crime. It's been a little confusing for a lot of people, though, and I completely understand. But no, it's still the same dumbass uh, channel that you uh, maybe enjoy watching or you just happened upon. Anyway, today is the long awaited cult series. I think it's probably going to be two, maybe three. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be three parts, which I don't really like multi-parters, but I also don't really like filming for hours on end. This has been a really difficult subject to tackle. You wouldn't think so because everybody calls Lori the doomsday cult mom, right? Cult mom, cult mom, and everybody knows it's a cult. I didn't really think so in the beginning, and there is a reason for that. I realized it much later, and I'll go into that. But my point is that it's a sensitive subject for me as a former member of the Mormon church, or as some people like to call it, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if I'm going to use a term that long, I'm going to call it what it actually is, which is the corporation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It just is. All right. So back to when I first started on YouTube. Now, we didn't have the documents. We didn't have a lot of information. We still don't have a lot of information, right? I was very hesitant to call the group a cult. I had a conception of people wearing matching jammies with bowl cuts, drinking cyanide, Waco. That was really my perception of what a cult was. A lot of people are like, well, it's pretty obvious, but I didn't recognize it. And the reason I didn't recognize it, and I later came to that conclusion, is because the behaviors I saw and that I was reading and hearing about, I was already familiar with. And so when you're in something, you can't quite recognize it as easily. And I had also felt like it was more part of this subculture that we know exists within the Mormon church membership. And so I was really thinking more that direction. A Mormon scholar had written about that, Christopher Blythe. I mean, I don't know if I would call him a scholar, but he's very well-known researcher. He had written an article which I thought really described Chad and Lori a lot better. I'll link it below if I remember, but it is in my first cult video, which was that they were part of this fringe movement or so-called fringe movement in the church, this subculture, and it was really difficult to necessarily categorize them as a cult because they didn't have their own doctrine. They still believed in the Mormon prophets, Mormon gospel. They had several beliefs that were still Mormon. There were things that I was looking for that I didn't see. My opinion, which has changed since then, was that this was more of a group of misfits. They were still practicing Mormonism to a degree. Not so much the shields and cages and all that shit, the energy healing, not so much that part. But their core belief system still seemed to align with the Mormon gospel, especially their beliefs surrounding the second coming. The difference was that they were putting themselves in these important roles. But these are roles that are predicted in Mormon scripture and in Mormon doctrine. Beliefs did evolve. Things evolved over time, which they do when you're an extremist, right? You get one idea and then you build and build and build and you go start going nuts with that. And that's, that's how cults are born. I'm going off of what I read, what I've seen, what the scriptures say, the discourses, that they clearly read and paid attention to. The earlier talks of Joseph Smith, these really obscure hidden doctrines that are still doctrine of the church. They are original doctrine. They are not practiced or necessarily believed in anymore by the general congregation, but they are doctrine. So it wasn't like a situation where a lot of people think it is or thought it was where Chad Dable got up, declared himself a prophet, started a whole new religion of this Church of the Firstborn, and Lori was ready and willing to be his co-pilot, and they were this individual... My lighting's changed. Fuck my lighting. Okay, anyway, what I saw was beliefs that were no longer really held by a lot of people, but also not really necessarily known about. I can't tell you how many times people have come on my channel telling me that I'm wrong and I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these older beliefs because they're not being taught. In fact, I had people deny that translated beings were part of the doctrine when I'm like, 
Third Nephi, chapter 28, kind of in there a lot, kind of a big thing. I had to expand my definition of cult is what I finally came to the realization of, is that my definition of cult was actually too narrow and not representative of what cult experts categorize as a cult. Because when I heard like MLMs were being categorized as a cult, I was like, give me a break. But then that LuLaRoe douchebag compared himself to Joseph Smith. And I was like, well, I can kind of see it now. What I'm going to talk about today is what I like to call the baby cult, which is the Chad and Lori cult. I'm going to go into a little bit of what I call the daddy cult. And then Yes, I am going to address the granddaddy cult. My friend who has done a lot of research on the group that Chad and Lori were involved with prior to leaving that group and starting their own difficult research has used the term a cult within a cult within a cult. I'm going to really go deep. I'm going to present it as neutrally as I can. It's not going to seem that way because, of course, I am biased but I'm going to try and present the case for the group that they came from, the organization they came from, why they claim not to be a cult. But I am going to go deep. I'm going to go where not a lot of people, a lot of cult experts won't go. I've wanted to talk about this for a long time, but I knew it was probably going to be the death of me. (laughs) And so I didn't plan on it necessarily, until I found out that Steve Hassan, who is a leading cult expert, has called the church a cult, the Mormon church a cult. Rick Ross, who a lot of people talk about as being one of the leading cult experts, he also, if you go on his website and you look at the alphabetical list of organizations, the Mormon church is on there and he has referenced them. I do now believe that Chada and Lori were a cult that stemmed from another cult that stemmed from another cult. Again, cult within a cult within a cult, which is the perfect way that Difficult Research described it. When I heard her say that, I was like, that that is exactly what this is. Exactly. It's an offshoot cult of an offshoot cult of a main cult. Steve Hassan defined a, a cult, and he gave several examples in his book, which I read, and really kind of what hit for me, like, oh, this was a cult, was when he said that you can have many cults, cults as small as two people. I was like, oh, okay. There were some things, and and there are some things with the larger cults that don't necessarily fit in with the cult definition, but a cult does not have to meet all of these criteria. The working definition of a cult, a religion or sect generally considered to be extremist or false under the guidance of an authoritarian charismatic leader for whom members exhibit fixed even religious veneration. They have one charismatic leader, the group's sole authority on truth, and only this leader decides or has the right to approve all policies and practices. Now, if we look at Chad and Lori Daybell, right, and we're assuming they are the cult leaders of this group, we see that Chad was definitely the go-to person, Chad and Lori, but that Chad and Lori were also continually referring to Jesus Christ and the prophets of the church. So I don't think they would consider themselves, I mean, maybe they do now, like I said, these things evolved as necessarily the leader of the belief system. But also, I don't know that they were that influential in decision-making considering in the text messages, Zulema did not want to move to Idaho and didn't as far as I know. These 10 cities were not in the making as of Chad Daybell. They were in the making years and years before this. Chad Daybell did not come up with the idea for 10 cities. He did not come up with the idea for people to move to Idaho. In fact, If you listen to some audio of David Warwick talking about his dreams, and that is on the channel Difficult Research, which I'll link, while they're taking a break and just having a conversation, you hear someone in that group say, We met with the church a week, a month and a half ago. Direct, we built tents with you. We met with the church a month and a half ago. We heard from their mouth the people that report directly to the presiding bishop, Rick, get ready for a seven point. Now, he didn't say it that way. Um, We talk tents and refugees and things like that first. So this gathering is not new. It is not just Chad Daybell. They are not even the sole leaders of the 144. I think a lot of people are like, oh, Chad and Lori believe that they were the only ones that were going to lead the 144. And that's not true. But for the group, he was the one interpreting 
things for them, even if he didn't claim himself to be a prophet. And definitely Zulema had bought it hook, line, and sinker. I think Melanie Gibb, too. I think the biggest thing with Melanie Gibb was that she wanted David Warwick to be the leader. I think they were involved in this, in my opinion, up to their necks. And it was really more of a power struggle thing of how things fell apart. But really, the group fell apart before it could be fully formed. So that's what I mean when I say they were well on their way. I think they kind of had formed one, but it just it fell apart. Members are zealous, protective, unquestioningly committed to the leader. We know for sure Lori was. We know that Zulema was, that Alex was. Melanie Gibbs says she wasn't. Melanie Pulowski appears to have been. So we know that they were all committed, but they were more so committed to this purpose that they felt they all had, to these roles that they felt they all had. So they were committed to that belief, that doctrine, and for Chad, in my opinion, to be the mouthpiece, and really Lori to be the mouthpiece for that. Members regard the leader's beliefs and practices as truth and law. The leader affirms and enforces this idea. They regarded the Mormon prophet, definitely. They talk about him in the text messages. There's no indication that they stopped believing in the words of the prophet, like there is with Denver Snuffer, who, by the way, has never claimed to be a prophet. This whole Snuffer movement, Denver Snuffer does not claim to be a prophet of this. He claims to have received these revelations, and these people just happen to agree with his revelations. What happens with these people that form or join these offshoots is they're researchers. And anybody who's in research knows if you have that passion, you will go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that gets to be problematic. Questioning doubt and dissent are discouraged or punished. If you were to question or disagree with Lori or Chad in any way, shape or form, you were then automatically labeled dark. Anybody that they felt was a challenge turned into a zombie. Leadership dictates how members should think, act, feel. Members require the leader's permission to change jobs, date, marry, or have children. Leader tells members where they can live and how to teach and discipline their children. We don't really have enough evidence, in my opinion, to really make a judgment on that. We do know that they wanted everybody to move to Idaho because they viewed it as Zion, and I think they probably viewed it as a city of Zion. There are several cities of Zion, but the main Zion is in Independence, Missouri. And so I really think where those white camps were going to be established, where this Zion was in Idaho, I think they were more like what is prophesied, which is that these events will happen, that there will be like cities of refuge on the way to the true Zion. I'm not so sure that anybody asked permission. It sounded like they really wanted direction, like Zulema really wanted direction for like everything. And I would not be surprised if they already owned land and other people in the larger daddy cult owned land up there. That wouldn't surprise me at all. This thing, like I said, has been going on for years and years. The group uses public humiliation and punishment, debilitating work, sleep deprivation, or other practices to create group think and to suppress individualism and doubt. I think murder is a pretty big punishment. Yeah, I think that's probably a big deal. So let's let's count that one. Criticism or jokes about the leader or group are taken very seriously and likely punished. Clearly, you turn into dark. Are you murdered? Group is elitist. Well, we don't even have to read the rest of that one. We know they felt like they were the elite, that they were in the 144,000, that they were part of the group of gatherers. We see that in basically what I view as one of their scriptures, their additional scriptures, Visions of Glory, which we've read. I just did a live last night that talks more about that. The author or Spencer talks about the fact that he was a gatherer. He was part of the 144,000. Anyway, leaders and members maintain there is only one path to truth and salvation. Well, gee, yeah, we know that, right? Uh, but we know that also comes from the one true church, the one true gospel, which also claims an elitist status. You know, the chosen, the saints, the elect. I think that they were in the hyper elect, but generally, scripturally and originally, Mormons do believe themselves to be the elect, the leaders of Zion. It's just true. That's part of the whole white horse prophecy. I have heard that there is another book out. I haven't read it, but I've heard that that writer goes into detail on the white horse prophecy. So I'm kind of curious to know what they were able to discover. It sounds really interesting to bring that in. But basically, the White Horse prophecy is, uh, and it was actually, I think, predicted to be Joseph Smith because he did run for president. But it's this prophecy that in the latter days, at some point, the church will take over the government. This is just a short explanation and turn the United States 
promised land into a theocracy. And that is their goal. Pretty fucking terrifying, right? People thought it was Mitt Romney. When Mitt Romney was running for president, they were like, is this the fulfillment of the prophecy? If you have a Mormon friend, you might want to keep them. They might come in handy. Just saying. So Rick Ross mentions 10 signs of a potentially unsafe group leader, absolute authoritarianism, no tolerance for questions or critical injury, No meaningful financial disclosure regarding budget expenses such as independently audited financial statements. Unreasonable fear about the outside world, such as impending catastrophe, evil conspiracies, persecutions. There's no legitimate reason to leave. Former members often relate the same stories of abuse and reflect a similar pattern of grievances now. Here is where things got kind of tough for me as I was like researching this. I had to start looking at Melanie Fibb and Zulema and uh, Melanie Pulowski as potential cult victims. <sighs> okay, they, they kind of were. And I don't like to admit that because I'm so angry about the things that they didn't do that they could have done that I think could have prevented murders. But I also think they were under a spell and they were vulnerable to, to becoming members of that group because they were already members of a group that made them vulnerable to that, in my opinion. The ambiguousness of the roles in the second coming, that did not hurt Chad and Lori's sales pitch. The fact that they could go in their scriptures and pull these things up. So it's not like Chad was just making wild claims. These things were in the scriptures. Chad knew it. Chad had been taught it. Chad got a lot of his ideas from the daddy cult. All these beliefs that you know, Melanie Gibbs, Zulema, and Chad, Lori, they were a big part of the subculture. They were obviously a big part of the church, but hidden and no longer practiced or really believed in disavowed and, and things like that. So they weren't necessarily things in the modern church, uh, but that's where they all stemmed from. You have like the original Mormon doctrine. I'm trying to like think of a visual aid because I'm so visual, but you have the original Mormon doctrine, right? And the original set of beliefs. And that's what they really focused on or really looked at. And then you had kind of like the moving away from that, which is into the modern church, even though it's like, okay, it's not even 200 years old, but let's just say like modern, like the last mm, 20 years and actually really the last five, because it's the last five where they're like, oh, we're losing members. We got to recruit. Oh, we got to go move towards that mainstream stuff. Forget about that weird planet shit, Adam, God, and even though it's still in our temple ceremonies and, oh, yeah, maybe we should uh, make it seem like women have more power and we got to change some buzzwords. And then you have this explosion from that of these people that are looking for more and that creates that subculture, which then makes those people vulnerable to the offshoot cults and groups. This has been going on since the beginning of the church as far as these offshoots because of the way the scriptures are written and the teachings of Joseph Smith and the whole one mighty and strong bullshit. Moving on, what I was getting to is that Zulema, Melanie, all these people have similar stories, or at least Melanie Gibb and Zulema kind of have similar stories in that they were made to feel very special. They were given these roles and then they were kind of Uh, I think Zulema believed in this shit till the very end. I think she was right or die for these two until the police told her that she was probably going to go to jail. And then she was like, okay, I'll talk. And that's why she has immunity. Just my opinion, speculation, everything I'm supposed to say so I don't get sued. There's just too much there, too much that I've seen, too much in the text messages. You know, at least Melanie Gibbs started doubting too late, but she did start doubting. Moving on. Group leader is always right. Followers can never be good enough. Group leader is the exclusive means of knowing truth or receiving validation. No other process of discovery is really acceptable or credible. Well, yeah, when you have like one person at the top, Uh, And then like a small group underneath them and then goes down to other leaders and then down, you know, it kind of kind of looks like this kind of thing. Yeah. And there's like a prophet, like a one true prophet, a living prophet. Uh, He's the only person that makes all decisions. Everything comes to him. And then it goes to like his other two little minions and then down to the 12. And the one true living prophet, he makes all of the decisions and you do not talk shit about that guy ever. Take that with what you will and decide who I'm talking about. You know, when I've said, well, the multiple mortal probations weren't a Chad thing. 
uh, Church of the Firstborn. It's not a Chad thing. And people have questioned me on that. And I'm like, because I knew it had to come from somewhere. I knew it was rooted. Everything that they've talked about, I'm like, it comes from somewhere. And if you look long enough and you go deep enough, it's coming from original Mormon doctrine. And they're using it to suit their narrative, to suit their needs. They are t- twisting it, but that's where it's coming from. So the ultimate weakness is an institutional weakness. In my profession, we look at systems and we look at instead of like individuals, we look at what is the system contributing to it? Because if you can resolve issues at the systems level, at the institutional level or a macro level, you can resolve issues within the individuals. Meaning. If you just, I don't know, fucking make a statement and take a hard line and continually talk about it instead of maybe once in a blue moon, give a talk in Boise back in 2015 where you warned about false prophets, but then you said you weren't there to warn about false prophets. You were just there to chat because you had some time off. Maybe more so than that, because clearly this warning that you sometimes give or half give is not getting through to these thick skulls. But if you were to change that at the institutional level, it could possibly uh, discourage this a little bit more. I don't think it would solve it. I don't know what the church can do to solve this problem. I have thought about that. Is there anything they can do at this point? And I think really their conclusion that they've come to is Every once in a while, we have to say these things so that people know that we don't agree with these people, but we really need their tithing money. Abraham Giliotti, who Melanie references in that uh, meeting that I did the commentary on, Lori's testimony, he was one of the September 6th, which was a group of six scholars, church scholars, who were publishing things the church didn't like, and they were all excommunicated. And there was one person reinstated, and that was Abraham Giliotti, Giliotti. I'm from Utah. We don't pronounce anything right. He's a big inspiration to these people and you reinstated his membership. Kind of problematic. Rod Meldrum knows several of the leaders and he is very highly regarded. Kind of fucking problematic. On Difficult Research's channel, I went to a Book of Mormon Evidence Expo, which is where these people go. They're all you know, involved in this and you can kind of see me going through there and get maybe a little bit of an idea of what those people are like. Few screws loose. My big message on this channel is one, to explain where the religious aspect came from. And two, to, because of my own curiosity and my own need to know more, to go into the depths of that. Ultimately, they're responsible. A lot of people, when I talk about the religious part, they're like, look, they murdered people. It's them. You can't blame their religion or you can't blame anything else except for them being evil and selfish and it being about sex. And I totally agree that their reasons were selfish, but they had multiple reasons and religion was part of what they used to justify it to themselves. And I always like to say it explains it doesn't excuse. I don't like it when people bring up mental illness and murder because that's often, you know, criminalizes people who are mentally ill. And I have mental illness and I've never, never thought about killing anybody ever talk shit about them behind their back. Sure. But I've never thought about killing them. And most people with mental illness are tend to be victims of crime rather than perpetrators. So I get it. But if it's part of the story, if it's part of what happened, it is what it is. I can't deny it. Like people will deny that their religion has anything to do with these murders. It does have a big role in it. It was, I think, the volet du I don't know how to pronounce it, but like madness of two, all these things combined. But at at the core, they were based on the these upbringings that Chad and Lori had, these beliefs that they had, this group they were involved in, the larger culture they grew up in, and the organization they grew up in. That doesn't make anybody else guilty for these murders. And I'm not blaming the church. I've never blamed the church for these murders. Chad and Lori are ultimately responsible. But what I'm saying is that there was an entire system around them that enabled them. Um, There's more. So 10 warning signs regarding people involved in a cult. Extreme obsessiveness with the cult leader. Uh, Individual identity gets blurred. Whenever a group leader is criticized or questioned, it's persecution. Pretty sure I know where they got 
that idea from. Uncharacteristically, stilted and seemingly programmed conversation and mannerisms, cloning of the group leader and personal behavior, dependency on the group leader for problem solving, solutions and definitions without meaningful reflective thought, seeming inability to think independently or analyze situations without group leader involvement. Well, clearly, Zuma, Chad, what do you think? Chad, Chad, I have to ask you another question. That hyperactivity centered on the group leader agenda. Yeah, I think they were all hyperactive. I think they were all smoking something, but like not a depressant. I think, well, I think they were sniffing stuff. You know what I mean? Light powder, countertops, mirrors, stuff like that. Wouldn't be surprised. But yeah, they were all like that. Dramatic loss of spontaneity and sense of humor. Increased isolation from family and old friends. Anything the group leader does can be justified no matter how harsh or harmful. Former followers are at best negative or worse evil under bad influences and they cannot be trusted. Personal contact is avoided. Yeah, that's pretty much describes them. So we kind of covered Chad and Lorehor and their group and kind of how my opinion has changed from what it was almost a year ago. And the larger kind of context, the larger the preparing of people, crowd, and then a little bit of what we are going to cover a lot more in depth in the next two videos. If you like this video, please subscribe, thumbs up, whatever. I don't know if this gave you any further information or if you even cared to hear it, but it's just something I guess I felt like I it was finally time to do. I was finally, I'm finally in the space that I can do it. I've been putting off this video for a long time and you guys know I've been feeding you little like, hey, I'm going to do this. Hey, I'm going to do this. And then I made the mistake last week of saying, I don't know what to do. And people were like, oh, you should do the cold video. And I was like, oh shit. I mean, I actually have to do it. I've gathered all this research and I know what I believe and I know what the evidence indicates, but I mean, I actually have to say it so that I can get probably a lot more hate than I've gotten, Then I have to risk my channel, possibly piss a lot of people off. And a lot of you know what I went through in like December or a few months ago <laughs> when I made the um, teeny, teeny comment on Twitter and yeah, I don't really want to go back there, but I think it is very important to call this what it is. I think it could have been prevented. I do. We can completely ignore the religious aspect, but I don't want to because I've seen it tear apart families. I've seen people really suffer. And I think a lot of people suffer because of Chad and Lori and the system that they were indoctrinated into. Anyway, thank you for visiting me today. And I hope you're ready for the part two and three because yeah. Alrighty, remember who you are and what you stand for, and hopefully you don't stand for cults. Bye bye now. Hosanna! 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 To God and the Lamb! Hosanna! 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 To God and the Lamb! Hosanna! 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 To God! and the Lamb. Amen. Amen.